I mean, I guess, <laughs> I guess if we get, in stu get stuck in Minneapolis, that's where we're supposed to be anyway, so. Right, Evan, is that, is that why you were late? You were scouting, scouting locations? <laughs> okay, hold on, I gotta, I gotta do this real quick, okay. This is actually for expenses to prove I was here. <laughs> hmm. Just need a computer, don't we? Is that on? Are we on? On? Okay. Hold on, one sec. Hold on. No. Let's put on. One sec, one sec. Jeez. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> let's let's start. Let's start. So this is a just in time, just in time presentation, not to be confused with just in time. <laughs> I'm Aaron. <laughs> uh, so so I, I'm an extremely, extremely horrible procrastinator. And uh, I, instead of working on my presentation, I kept putting stuff in, like doing actual work and putting stuff in Slack. And, and Eileen suggested that I title my talk, Things I've Been Doing Besides Preparing My Talk, uh, because I get a lot done when I am supposed to be doing something else. <laughs> anyway, I get, I get extremely, extremely nervous about giving presentations, and I'm always paranoid that I'm going to uh, go way, way too fast, and I won't have enough slides. Um, so the other day, like the other day, uh, DHH made this tweet. He said, I, "I'm just going to say it. I hate foo, bar, and baz as prototypical, prototypical variable names. It's time for a change." And this made me laugh a lot. Uh, so I. I <laughs> I made a little video about it and I tweeted about it and I'm like, there's one slide done, yes. <laughs> this is what I'm doing, working on my presentation and then, and then, and then, DHH liked it and I'm like, yes, <laughs> there's two slides done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting like four or five slides out of this. <laughs> So I, I think the presentation's going going okay so far. <laughs> anyway, uh, hello. Oh, hello there. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. I uh, may look different on the internet than I do in person. This is what I look like online. If you don't recognize me, uh, if you don't, re some of you may have noticed uh, maybe a cat picture coming up on your screen. I don't know if you recognize this, but. Um, Jason and Kevin, I'm not sure why. You should have accepted my, my airdrop. I'm not sure. I had sent this, uh, this one too. Jeez, Gabrielle, come on. I'm just trying to send you photos of my cat, please. <laughs> anyway, I work, for a, I work for a very small startup company uh, called GitHub. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it is the only legit company I've ever worked for. Uh, I, I really enjoy using Git, but I will not force push it on you. Uh, now I make this I make this pun at every conference, and uh, <laughs> my coworkers told me that I really need to branch out. Um, but I, I I had to say to them, look look, I'm just really committed to these Git based puns. Not even not even flogging me is going to stop me. In fact, even if you reflogged me, that wouldn't stop me. <laughs> Anyway, if you don't like if you don't like these Git based puns, we could switch to SVN, but I just don't know what the Git diff would be. <laughs> How long do we have left? <laughs> All right, so, so <laughs> I love I love titles. I, I, at, at GitHub, I am a level five engineer. <laughs> I am level five, and despite the fact that I have played Xenoblade for over 90 hours, I still don't have enough XP to level up to level six engineering. So I'm going to be working on this every day, and my boss is here in the audience. I'm going to be working on Xenoblade every day until I can get up to a level six engineer. <laughs> so, 
I guess I should go to real content. No, not yet. I love, I love local businesses. I love local businesses. Before I visit any place, I look up the best local businesses for that place so that I can go help support them. And <laughs> I was inclined to learn more about Pittsburgh. Come on, come on, come on. Anyway, so you may or may not know this, Heinz is a local, local business, so I bought some ketchup that is hashtag local, yes. <laughs> this is really exciting. I, I wanted to support local businesses even more, so I picked up some Heinz Texas barbecue sauce. That is also hashtag local, this is exciting. Uh, then I went and picked up some Heinz beans, uh, and these are actually amazing because there's 57 varieties of beans. You may not know this, there's 57 different varieties. But anyway, I, I thought this was really neat, but unfortunately I looked at the back of the can and they're actually made in England, so they're hashtag not local. So I apologize for that, I was trying real hard. I'm not sure what the deal is there. So anyway, I love local businesses and I hope you, uh, Got the point. Pittsburgh people, yes, yes, come on. I know there's I know there's like five people in the audience that got this one and I'm sure you're laughing real hard. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. <laughs> the end of RailsConf where I waste, I waste one of your hours. <laughs> so the day before yesterday I learned I've got 99 problems, and I guess they're all yours. <laughs> anyway, I love, I really, really love coming to RailsConf, and uh, it's really exciting for me to be here. I like to visit everyone, everyone here. I feel like it's kind of a homecoming for me. Like, I get to see all the, you know, old faces and new faces, meet new people, see other folks on the Rails core team, do a lot of mingling. So I like to, I wanna catch up everybody on what I've been doing over the past year. So this past year, I actually, I became an uncle, which is exciting for me. I've never been an uncle before. This is my niece. Uh, this is uh, me touching her face. <laughs> Surprised my sister let me do this. <laughs> Uh, since this past year, I actually became extremely famous in Japan. This is, this is true, and if we have time at the end of the presentation, I will tell you exactly why. But I made this tweet right here. It is one character, one, one character, and it garnered 81,000 likes, which <laughs> I, from a social media perspective is like a really good deal. Like characters per like is like very, very efficient here. This is worth my time. So. Any of you social media managers out there, look at this, one, look at your likes per character. I mean, this one's like great. Anyway, so this, this is well worth your investment. I, I decided to become a thought leader again. Every year I wanna be a thought leader, but it just doesn't work out. But the only role model I have for thought leadership is DHH. Uh, so I decided the first thing that I should do is get a headshot like his, so I've got this new headshot. <laughs> and. You may notice the resolution is a little bit a little bit off on mine, but that's because I've got an older Mac, it's still a 480p camera, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not quite there, I'm still working on it. But anyway, I saw he, like, I follow him on Instagram and he has this amazing desk, so I thought, well, I, I wanna have an amazing desk like this too, I'll set it up, like, I can become a thought leader too if I have the right desk. So I wanna show you, like, I put together mine like this, this is DHH's office and here's mine. It's exactly the same, you can see. It's perfect. In fact, one thing I noticed when I took, a, when I took this photo, there, there is actually that photo of this. <laughs> but, but really, I'm, I'm actually really, really good friends with DHH. Uh, just check out this selfie that we took together. Uh, <laughs> In fact, in fact, he invited me over to his house the other day, so I went and I took a photo, and this is it. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, it's a little dark, isn't it? <laughs> All right, uh, 
this is, this is just a test slide. So I was doing a test slide here. Um, I just wanted to see if this would actually work. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. There's, there's something right there in the slide. It's right between the, the S and the W. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that right there, but it is a zero width space that is character that's between those two. And we're actually gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. This is just a test slide. Anyway, so, <sighs> this tweet really annoys me. <laughs> So I have, I have like really weird conversations in my head. Like, I, I, I think I have a problem focusing or something. I don't know, I have a weird conversations with people in my head. I think, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this and this is how the conversation is going to go. And I kept replaying it over in my head and I'm like, you know, I, I, have, to, I have to get this down somewhere so I made a video out of it. This is, this is the video I made. <laughs> Anyway, this, so this is what's going through my head, like I'm having this conversation in my head. Unfortunately, like DHH is the last one to say something. So anyway, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about this foobar and baz as prototypical variable names, and then I'm thinking about code in Ruby, and I don't know if all of you know this, but a valid identifier in Ruby is anything that is not a space, basically. So this code works. I'm defining a method that's named smiley face, and I'm calling the smiley face method there at the bottom. So if I run this, it'll work and print out neat. Uh, this also works, like I've got a, I've got a method with spy, smiley face, and it takes keyword arguments, and the keyword is a green heart. Uh, defaults to a train, and you can call it in passing keyword arguments, and it prints out that little trolley thing there. So this is what I was thinking about as foobar and baz because they're really just you know, rep representing something. And I thought, okay, well, what, what else can we do with this code? Uh, here, is, here is another example. <laughs> can, any, can anyone see what's going on with this code? I, I'll, I'll wait, I'm gonna wait for you to type it out on your laptop. You can give it a try. It actually works, this really works. No? Okay. All right, so I'll explain it right here at the very top. The name of this method is actually a non-breaking space. So there's a non-breaking space right there, and down at the bottom there's another non-breaking space, so I'm calling the method with a non-breaking space. And if we look at this in Vim, you can actually see it. On the right uh, is the source code in Vim. You can see the non-breaking space character there, but when we cat the file and actually run it, uh, it, wor it totally works fine. So let's extend the program just a little bit. We're gonna do one extension to it here. Uh, in this case, we have a method with the name, the name of the method is a non-breaking space, and we have a parameter given to the method that is a zero width, zero width joiner. So right there, that's our name, our parameter we're calling puts. So here it is, here it is again in Vim, you can see like right there, and this is, of course this is Seattle style, there's no parentheses. So, you can see in Vim we've got the non-breaking space and the, the, <laughs> the other space, and it, it totally works fine. So what I'm proposing today is that instead of using foo and bar, we replace foo with zero width joiner, <laughs> we replace bar with non-breaking space. So, <laughs> all right, with that, let's, let's write some production, <laughs> production ready code. <laughs> I dare all of you to put that in your app code tonight. <laughs> Wait, don't do that, don't do that. Don't, don't, okay. All right, so today, today, surprise, surprise, we're going to talk about performance. I always give performance talks. We actually just had our performance reviews at work. <laughs> My boss is in the audience. <laughs> we, you did a great job on my performance review. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna talk about performance today, but I don't wanna talk about the speed of your code. Uh, I wanna talk about the speed of your development, like your actual development, getting, getting features done and actually uh, making that website that you need to ship. Now the thing is, I, I was thinking about this and we're always getting faster. We're learning new tools, we're learning new technologies, we're learning, we're lear learning new techniques, uh, but Unfortunately, it seems like as time goes on, your team velocity gets slower and slower. 
You, it takes longer to add a new feature, it takes longer to ship your code. So why, why does this happen? This seems paradoxical. Who is this mythical man? Why are we concerned with his month? <laughs> but seriously, why, why are we slower? Why are we slower to ship these features over time? And what can we do about it? Well, there's, there's different ways that we can deal with some sort of situation like this. One of, those, one of those ways to deal with this situation is to rewrite. We want to rewrite our code. We want to chase that dragon, that dragon that we felt, that high when we wrote Rails new and we could get all of those features out the door really quickly. We want to throw away all that code and say, okay, I'm going to begin again. Feel that, feel that exhilaration when you can ship new features quickly. But if you're doing this all the time, if you're just rewriting something, uh, all you're doing is going down the same path over and over again. Maybe the weather has changed, but the places you're going are exactly the same. What good is this velocity that you get if you're just running down the same path over and over again? Now, the day before yesterday, I learned that if you don't want to deal with these hard problems in your program, uh, you can just hire someone to fix it. <laughs> hire someone better than you to fix that scaling issue in your application. Now, unfortunately, I cannot afford that. <laughs> so I have to pick a different, I have to pick a different solution. Uh, I choose to refactor. We could, we could choose to refactor our code. We could make, Im make performance improvements and pay off technical debt, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is, it seems like we have these two different arcs juxtaposed against each other as application developers. It seems that we're either, we either have to be software writers or we have to be a PhD in computer science to work on, work on an application. Now, in my opinion, there has to be something in between. We can't just only be software writers. We can't only be PhDs in computer science. We have to go deeper into the application. We have to go down this cliff so that we can actually solve these more difficult problems. Now, as we learned day before yesterday, I am the only one who can fix this. <laughs> and we've recently learned that that doesn't actually work out. The truth is that you're the only one that can fix your application code. So the generic features that Rails provides gives you a great bootstrap. You can get going early. We give you all the things that a generic web application would require to ship a feature, but as time goes on, your application is getting more and more unique. You know your business logic. You know your business. I don't know your business. I can't help you with that. So I think this is one of the reasons that uh, application development starts to slow down over time is we have, to, we have to get better at our particular domain. So those generic features in Rails give us a huge, huge boost. And I think this is why I like to focus on Rails a lot. This is why I speak about profiling and speed improvements with Rails is because I want people to be able to take their Rails application and live with it for a long time. I want them to have a successful business, not have to run into these scaling issues as often. So I love, I love Rails and I want Rails to continue for a very long time, so this is why I study these particular things. So today we're gonna be talking about profiling and tuning. Uh, we're gonna specifically look at runtime and memory management, uh, which sometimes I like to call time and space because it makes me feel like I'm on Star Trek. And <laughs> it makes me feel a little bit more important than I actually am. So let's look at some, let's look at some stuff. We're gonna look at types of profilers uh, and how to use them, how to build them, and basically how to improve our per application performance with them. So there are two types of profilers that I typically deal with. One is called an exact profiler and one is called a sampling profiler. And to figure out which profiler you need when you're profiling your application, you just need to ask yourself a couple of questions. If you're asking, the thing that you're trying to solve, if you're asking is how many, how many of something, how many method calls, how many object allocations. If you need to know an exact precise number, then you want to use an exact profiler. Now, if you don't care about an exact number, like let's say you need to know, uh, is this, what is the slowest method? How, what percentage of time does this particular thing take? You wanna use a sampling profiler. So if your question is how much, use a sampling profiler. So in order to figure out which one you need, just ask the question out loud. What is the thing that I'm trying to do? What am I trying to solve? 
So let's take a look at exact profilers. We're gonna actually implement an exact profiler so that we can understand the way that it works. Uh, this is an example of an exact profiler written in Ruby. It uses the trace point API. Uh, this trace point, basically what it does is it hooks into the call method and every time a method gets called, once we enable the trace point, uh, our hook method will actually get called. So we listen for the event and every time we get an event, we just keep track of that and increment the counter. And you'll see at the bottom of this code here, it outputs the result which says, okay, benchmark me was called once, fast was called a thousand times, and slow was called 10 times. Now if this code wasn't so simple, you might look at this and think, oh, the place I need to optimize is the fast method, or the method called fast. That's the thing I need to optimize, it's called the most. But obviously when we look at this code, we can tell the slow method is a slow one. So this is the particular case where we wouldn't want to use an exact profiler. This is misleading us. If, we're, if our goal is to speed up this code, we don't want to use an exact profiler in this particular example. Now the other profiler is a sampling profiler. And this sampling profiler, what it does is it stops your program at, uh, at intervals, regular intervals, and it asks the program, what you thinking about? So every so often, it asks what you're thinking about and it just records it. So every so often, we have, a, we have a program here that's running, so time is along the bottom. Our program runs, it stops, we record what it's doing, and we keep doing this at regular intervals until we're done uh, sampling it. Now the idea behind this type of profiler is that, let's say you have a slow method. If your method is slow, then the probability of being in that method anytime you stop the program is higher. So we can tell that if we're in this one particular method frequently, if that shows up frequently within these samples, that's probably where our slow code is. So we can write a sampling profiler in Ruby. Here's an, here's an example of it. What this profiler does is it starts up a thread and it asks the main thread at an interval, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, every so often. And you can see at the bottom we have a, we have a re results from that. And in this particular example we have a, almost 6,500 uh, samples inside the sleep method, and maybe one, one sample inside the slow method. So we don't know how many times the sleep method was called, but we do know that when it's being sampled, it's very frequently in the sleep method. So 99% of the time we sample, we know it's inside the sleep method, so that's the thing that we need to target. Our fast method didn't even show up in this profiler. So when to use exact versus sampling? Uh, it depends on what you're trying to measure. Again, if you're trying to get absolute counts using exact profiler, uh, for example, the number of objects in the system or the number of times a method was called or API or whatever. Uh, if you're trying to reduce time or space, then you wanna look at a sampling profiler. If you're not sure, use a sampling profiler. Sampling profiler is what you need uh, about 99.963% of the time. That is with one sample. <laughs> Check my math, it's wrong. <laughs> so let's take a look at some runtime profiling and tuning. We're gonna talk about tuning your runtime. To profiling your runtime and tuning your runtime. So the th my favorite tool for doing uh, runtime profiling is a tool called StackProf. This thing uses MRI's built-in sampling capabilities so it doesn't spin up its own thread. Uh, you can actually use a timer inside of Ruby. Ruby has a timer inside the C code, not inside the Ruby code, that lets you sample uh, every so often. So StackProf just uses that built-in capabilities, and it looks very similar. The API looks very similar to the one that we wrote earlier. We just wrap up our code inside this uh, block, execute it, and when you execute it, it saves a profile to a dump file. So I've specified profile.dump here. And when we're done with that, we can just run StackProf on that and it dumps out all the sampling information. And this, uh, this looks similar to the information we got in our, our profiler, just much nicer, right? So we get kind of the same information, 999 samples. Again, we can't tell how many times the slow method was actually called. We just know that it's in the slow method very frequently. So we can use this to benchmark uh, Rails boot time. So let's, bench, let's benchmark the Rails boot process. Let's talk about the Rails boot process. So let's take a look at how a breakdown of the Rails boot process. Uh, if we look at it like this, uh, where time is moving along to the, to the right there, we can divide it into a few different sections. So at the very beginning here, that's where, that's where we hit enter. We hit enter right there. 
Then we start requiring files, and once we've loaded and required all the files, we start what's called compilation, we're compiling the app. It's not really a compilation phase. Essentially what it's doing is taking all of your rack middleware and putting it all together, and then handing that middleware off to whatever your web server is. In this case, we're using Unicorn. So after compilation occurs, we hand off the application to Unicorn. Now after that, when you get your first request, it has to compile the views and then actually execute your business logic. So if we look at this from a little bit higher level, we can say that these steps here, these requiring files and app compilation, we can say that that's our time where we're not ready for requests yet. We're spending time here and we're just not ready to respond to a request. And uh, Now the first request that comes in, it's gonna spend time compiling our views and then executing the business logic for that page. And then the second request is only going to execute the business logic. So if we want to profile these things, now we know what to talk about, where we're actually looking. So knowing this, we can figure out what we need to benchmark depending on the task. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at benchmarking a script, just a startup script. This is an example here. We have, um, we just load config environment. This is how you would benchmark uh, that very first slice before we're actually compiling the views. This is going to load all of your applications, information, all of your, I don't know, models and stuff if you're using uh, production mode. Uh, maybe it's lazily loading in development. But this is how you can benchmark that overhead for your scripts. Now if we look at the output from this, you'll see, okay, it looks very similar to our previous output. But I want to call out one thing in here. You can see that we're spending some time in garbage collection right there, GC. So we can see what percentage of our time is spent in GC. And we're going to look at, look at how to improve that time a little bit later. So runtime tuning. I'm going to talk a little bit about tuning your runtime. Now the thing is, Ruby will try to execute your code as fast as it can. So there's not really much runtime you can, tuning you can do. The best thing that you can do is to write faster code. <laughs> Obviously we want the Rails framework to be as fast as possible, but at some point we can't make the framework any faster, so you need to look at your own code to see what's, see what's slow about it. And the most advice I can give about that is say like, okay, use these tools, find where your bottleneck is, look at it and say, well, is there a faster way to do the same thing? Can I do this thing in a faster way? Is, do we need to even do this thing so much? Maybe I can only do it, I only need to do it once or twice. Or maybe I can defer this until a later moment. Maybe I don't need to do it right now. So these are questions that you should be asking yourself as you're trying to tune your, tune your uh, application. All right, let's take a look at memory tuning. We talked about, we talked about uh, tuning runtime. Let's take a look at space, actually using memory in your application. Uh, but before we get to memory tuning, we need to talk a little bit about memory, how memory is handled in Ruby, and I, I hate this so much. This made me so mad. How, how did David know that I am going to talk about garbage collection in this presentation? <laughs> am I that transparent? <laughs> Why? <laughs> he said that in his talk, and I'm like, no, <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about a garbage collector. The GC has two responsibilities in your application. One, it frees memory, and this is the thing that most people think about the garbage collector doing. It's freeing up your memory. But the other thing that it does for you is it actually allocates memory. I think people, people don't think about this as much, and I think the reason is because of the name. It's called garbage collector, and you think, oh, I'm just taking stuff away. But it's actually in charge of allocating your memory, too. So what is MRI's GC? I'm going to tell you what it is. We're not going to go through all of the algorithms and stuff, but I just want to give you a high-level overview so that when you have time later, you can Google these words. Because that's really what's most important, is knowing the keywords to Google. Seriously. So. Uh, Ruby's garbage collector is a mark and sweep garbage collector. It's generational, has incremental marking, lazy sweeping, and uses a free list, free list uh, for allocation. I feel really, really bad for the translator. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, the generational, generational part of this just is a optimization on top of mark and sweep. It makes your GC faster. Uh, incremental marking and lazy sweeping mean that we have shorter pause time. So when, it, uh, 
MRI's garbage collector is concurrent, it is not parallel, and what that means is as your program is running, every once in a while it has to stop and do something. Now these incremental marking and lazy sweeping mean that those pause times are very short, and what that does is it, it increases the throughput of your program, so you can actually run code, run stuff through it faster. So one question I think is interesting is, when can the GC collect garbage, or when does the GC collect garbage? When does that happen? Well, there's three, three main places. If you just call gc.start, it will collect garbage, though it's not guaranteed. And any, none of these are guaranteed. These are just locations where it could collect garbage. That's why I said can. So if you call gc.start, it will, it will do a collection. Maybe it's not guaranteed, but it will, don't worry. Now, another, another case is when you allocate an object. If you need to allocate an object, the GC may do a collection. Or if you allocate memory via malloc, the GC may do a collection. So allocating objects and allocating via malloc are two, different, two very different things, and we're gonna talk about the differences between those in a minute. So this leads us to what, what is an object in Ruby? In Ruby, an object is a 40-byte chunk. It's just a chunk of memory that's 40 bytes wide. So let's say we have, a, we have some code that looks like this here at the bottom. It's a string that says, OMG, this is a very long string. Okay, now this string is obviously too large to fit inside of a 40 byte chunk. So how do we actually store this? How can we have a string that's, a, that's this long? The way that it actually works is, rather than storing that string inside of the Ruby object itself, we have a string object that points at something else. So we have a string object, a Ruby string object, that points at a C string object. Now, the garbage collector is in charge of allocating these Ruby objects. And malloc, the system malloc, is what's in charge of allocating these strings. So we have a Ruby object that points at a uh, C object. So these are, in this particular case, we have two places where a GC could have happened. Now, Ruby doesn't allocate one object at a time. Instead, it allocates a page. So an object is a 40 byte chunk, and when you say give me an object, it pulls that object out of a page that contains many objects. So Ruby won't actually, or the GC won't allo actually allocate one, it'll allocate a page, and then it'll give you one of the objects inside of that page. So f in this particular example, we allocate our Ruby string, our string is just a Ruby object inside the page, and it points at a different string that was allocated via malloc, and in this case we have two places where the GC may have run. So a slot is a location where a Ruby object may or may not be, and this slot term is important when it comes to tuning the garbage collector because we, we allocate in terms of slots, well, in terms of pages, and those pages have slots, and this is the way that we tune it, is by the number of slots that we have available. So we can control the total amount of free space in the, in the uh, program and the way that we control it is via this term slots. So let's look at some tuning parameters. Uh, GC tuning is done via environment parameters, and we're gonna take a look at some of them and what they do. So this is the first one, first one we'll look at is called Ruby GC heap init slots. I don't expect anyone to remember this. I promise I will put these slides online so you can just Google it later. <laughs> but we can see how it impacts the process here. If we run Ruby, you can see the number of available slots with no tuning is about 1,800. We have about 1,800 slots available. Now, if we say in it with 600,000 slots and we run it, it has about 600,000 slots available. So with this particular parameter, we can say, I want this many objects or this many free spaces declared when the script boots or when the program boots. So let's take a look at that, let's take a look at that profile that we looked at a little bit earlier. Uh, this is an example here, we have our app boot. Uh, this is the default, default uh, case that we saw previously, no, no changes. You can see how I ran the script at the bottom of the slide there. Now it's spent about 16% of its time in allocation, 16.5% of its time in GC. Now if we tune the slots and say we wanna init with a bunch more slots, we can do this, we just say, let's set that environment variable to 600,000. You can see the command at the bottom. And in this case, we only spent about 8.3% uh, of our time, or 8.5% of our time in the GC. So we can see kind of an impact on that when we do go to boot our application. In the top one, there's no tuning, and it took about 4.1 seconds. And in the bottom, bottom example, it took about 
3.5 seconds. And this is a default application, default Rails application, uh, where I just randomly chose a number. And the nice thing about this is that we didn't have to change any of our application code and we were able to decrease the boot time just by saying, hey, I want you to prepare a bunch of room for allocation. So we didn't need to change our app code at all. You can use this, if you, if you measure the objects that are allocated in your system, you can come up with a good number for this and then decrease your boot time just by tuning this particular parameter. The other thing that we can do is we can control growth and these are very long, very long. <laughs> so we can control the growth of our heap via these, these particular parameters and again, don't, you don't need to remember these. The important is that we're applying a ratio to the amount of free space that we have in our application. The GC tries to maintain a certain amount of free space for you to allocate into. And we can, specify the, we can specify those ratios. So we have a minimum ratio, a maximum ratio, and a goal ratio. So we have our min and our max, and we're trying to hit the goal. So kind of a window there. Now let's take a look at a test program. We have a program here. This is our test program, and it just allocates a whole bunch of objects. It allocates 600,000 objects. Now what I want to do is I want to study how many times the garbage collector had to expand its heap while we were running this program. So each time we allocate a new object, we may have to expand that heap, and we wanna look at how many times we actually had to expand the heap. So if we set our goal to particular values, uh, we, can, we can look at, or we can, excuse me, we can study how many times it had to expand the heap by checking the GC count. So if we tweak the goal numbers a little bit, and then graph it, we can see a different behavior, and this is an example of that behavior. Uh, our goal, the blue line, our goal is set to 0.2, and our green line, the goal is set to 0.7. Now the interesting thing about this is we're able to hit that 600,000 mark in fewer GCs with a larger goal. We're essentially telling the GC, okay, I want you to be aggressive about allocating memory, then allocate it and then expand into that. Since we're aggressive about allocating memory, we're able to hit that goal or hit that 600,000 mark sooner. So unfortunately, this means that we have more memory growth. We're, being, we're not being conservative about our memory growth. The blue line, we're more conservative about memory growth, but we have to spend more time in GC, so we're using more CPU time. So it really depends on what your application is doing and what you're trying to tune for. If you want to tune for fewer GCs, you may want to increase your goal. If you want to tune for lower memory usage, you may want to decrease your goal. And you can actually try this at home. Again, this, is, this slide is literally just for being online later, so don't like write this down or anything, please. Like you wrote down the uh, example code with the, with the non-breaking space in it. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at some memory profiling. Uh, I saved this for last because I actually have a story to go along with it. Um, at work, somebody, somebody pinged me at work and we have, a, we have an application at work, it's called the GitHub Enterprise. And basically what it is, is it's a version of GitHub that we ship out to clients and they host it in their data centers. Uh, it's just, I guess, stored in a container or something. I don't really know all the details. But one of the people on the team came to me and said, Aaron, uh, I've noticed that um, as time goes on, the application that we're shipping is consuming more and more memory. It's getting larger and larger. And do you know, you know, can you help with this? Do you know why this is? So I said, okay, well, I'll take, you know, I'll take a look at it and see if I can figure out what the problem is. And the first tool that I reached for was StackProf because it is my favorite tool to use. And this is an example of using StackProf with object allocations. We can use a sampling profiler with object allocations. So I ran this code, I required our environment and took a look at the output from that. And this is what the output looked like. It told me that we were spending, this isn't actually our application, this is a sample app. Uh, but it said, oh, we're, we're making a lot of allocations inside of the require method. Now the problem with this type of profiling is that uh, even though we made a lot of allocations in the require method, those objects aren't necessarily retained. They may not live for the life of the program. So if they don't live for the life of the program, we don't really care. It's not contributing to our bottom line, so to speak. So in this case, we actually needed to switch to exact profiling. This is a case where we said, I need to know how big is the heap. I need to count exactly the number of objects that are in memory right now. So this is a case where you want to use exact profiling. 
And to do that, I use object space. This is my favorite tool for doing exact memory profiling. And the way that I use this is via heap dumps. So this is, this is a way to get a heap dump, and I will describe it a bit here. Uh, this dumps your heap to a JSON file, and in this case, I'm just dumping it to a file named mydump.json. This line up here, the second line, what it does is it enables allocation location recording. That's fun to say. Uh, any objects that are allocated before this line, we don't know where they've been allocated. The garbage collector does not keep track of where they are allocated. After this line, when we, when we call this, this method, it tells the GC, hey, every time an object is allocated, I want you to record where it got allocated. So anything that's allocated after that line, we know where, we can find out where it was allocated. And those, that information will actually be inside the heap dump. So after, we've, after I enabled that, I said, okay, let's require the application, boot it up. After we required the allocation, I say, okay, I want to clear out the, do it, run a GC, I want you to clear out any objects that are temporary, that aren't going to live for the life of the program. Then dump out the heap. So once the heap is dumped out, we just have this JSON file, and each line in the JSON file represents one object. One line is one object. And this is, I know this is hard to read, so I've made it a little bit nicer here. So this is an example of an array. We can tell it has the type, it says array. Uh, it sh gives you a list of all of the references, so those are all the objects that it's pointing to. And we can actually see the allocation location of that object. And finally, my favorite is the memory size of that object. And these JSON files make for a very extremely easy analysis. So for example, let's say I wanna know how many objects are alive. Just how many objects do I have in the system? Very easy, I just count the number of lines in the file and I know. So this example had about 185,000 objects. Done. Okay, so how about I wanna know what file is most popular? This is one tool I really like to use, JQ. If you don't have the JQ tool, get this, it's amazing. Basically, it parses, it lets you, it's like a really great grep for a JSON. So I can say, hey, I want to extract the file, just the file field, I'm gonna sort it and get unique them, uh, then I'm gonna sort those by the number of counts, and then just get the top 10. When I run this, I can see, okay, well, the top, top allocations came from active support dependencies.rb. So I know it came from that file. Okay, I've focused in on that file. Now I can use uh, JQ again and say, well, I only care about allocations that are inside that file, so I want you to filter out all of the allocations for that file and then give me the line. Then we run through the same, basically the same command again. Sort them, get the unique count, uh, sort by count, and then get the, the last 10. So we can see here, okay, the most popular line inside that file is line 283. So I know, okay, I need to go look at that file, look at that line, and now I, now I can kind of get an idea of why we're allocating so much stuff. So we can, also, we can also answer other interesting questions like, how much memory does active support allocate? So I just say, okay, give me all of the records whose file contains active support, extract the mem size from that, pipe that to a little awk command, and sum the total, and we can see that, okay, active support allocated, what is that, like around three megs. Okay, so back to, our, back to our performance problem at work. We ran into a thing, I wanna talk about hidden references. This is, this is the thing that we ran into. Uh, we could, we were trying to find what has references to what. Basically this heap dump contains all the information of the entire object graph. We can make a graph out of it, so let's talk about references. This is very simple, we have an array, it references two things, this is obvious. Right, we can see, okay, we have an array, it points at two symbols. Now here, here's another example of some references in a, in a program. We have a lambda, this function foo, it returns a lambda, and that lambda sums the two values that you passed in, right? So the variable m uh, contains two references, and I promise this isn't a trick, there are no non-breaking spaces in this code. <laughs> so, all right, here, here's a question for you. Uh, here's a similar code. The foo method returns a lambda. How many, how many references does this lambda have? You don't, you don't need to answer. I will, I will tell you the answer, just think. How many references does it, does it have? It actually has two references. The reference is the number A and B, and there are two reasons why this lambda has references to those variables. One, Ruby doesn't do what's called escape analysis. So it doesn't look at the lambda block and say, oh, I'm not actually using those things. 
there's no reason to keep track of them. And the other thing, which is um, basically an implementer's nightmare, is a thing called binding. <laughs> so if you ask the lambda for its binding, that binding object is the environment in which the lambda was created. You can actually ask the binding, hey, what local variables do you know about? And it says, hey, I know about A and B. They were local when I created, when the lambda was created. And then you can say, hey, binding, give me the value of A and B. So we actually have these references. This lambda contains references to A and B, but you can't really see it when you're just reading the code. So I was able to find these particular locations. Unfortunately, I didn't understand this code. Like I could point to it and say, hey, that's the problem. There, we're allocating a bunch of stuff there. But I couldn't really fix it. So I uh, worked with other folks on the team and they actually rolled out fixes for this that eliminated those, eliminated those uh, hidden, hidden references. And we were actually able to drop uh, 200 gigabytes from our uh, memory from our production application. So this was like really awesome. And I praised the person who did this a lot. It was amazing, a really amazing change. So I wanna talk about some tools that I want. Uh, and then maybe some thought leadery stuff and then we'll wrap up with another story and maybe two stories depending on my time. Uh, so let's look at the Rails boot process again. Uh, unfortunately, so far all we've been doing is looking at, um, looking at analysis of scripts like maybe running DB migrate or uh, other scripts that you run with your application. We haven't looked at anything else. What about app compilation time? I mean, when we run this, it's easy to know, okay, this is, this is, how, much our, this is how much our scripts are spending inside of just loading the, allocate, or loading the application, but what about that actual compilation time? I wanna know how long does it take to restart a web server? I wanna optimize that. How do we deal with that? So how do we deal with benchmarking the rest of these things? We only looked at that one. So today we're gonna to take a look at uh, some new rack up op options that I've added uh, in order to deal with this particular situation. So rack, uh, we merged this into rack a couple weeks ago. This is one of the things that I was doing instead of working on my talk. Uh, in newer versions of rack, you'll be able to say, hey rack, I want you to dump the heap before you, or after you comp compile the application, but before you give it to the web server or I want you to profile, uh, profile the application up until you give it to the web server. So we're going to build this tool into Rack for you so that if you wanna know why is it taking so long for my application to restart or be ready for requests, we can actually have this built into Rack and give you some information. So you know how to identify, identify problems in your code and we've done the benchmarking, written the benchmarking code for you. So, this just leaves us with two other, two other issues, uh, our warm up time and our actual, and our run time. So we're able, to, we're able to profile script boot time, we're able to profile compiling applications, but we're missing two components. Now last year, uh, Eileen spoke about pr uh, system tests. And this is a really important thing, so besides the fact that now you can do entire system tests, uh, this is an important refactoring on Rails itself. It means that we can actually run real requests through the application. So something that looks more like, more like a request that you would see in production. Before we had system tests, most of the stuff, this, I mean, we on the Rails core team knew this, and maybe most people did not, but um, a lot of the integration tests were basically just um, BS. Uh, <laughs> And I want to say that, I'm trying to say that in the nicest term, nicest way possible. They, they would actually run the data, run these uh, requests through only your application. It would not consider any middleware that you had in your application. And this is the advantage of the system test, is that they actually run the data all the way through the middleware into your application and then back out. So you can get a more real world idea of performance of your application. So now that we have that, now that we have that system in place for running these uh, system, System tests. <laughs> Sorry, I, I said I'm a little scatterbrained, right? Okay. So now that we have this system in place, 
we can run real requests through and actually benchmark those. So we have a script for doing this at work. It's called this, this is bench app. We use this for uh, benchmarking our actual requests at work. And this is what the output looks like. It's very easy to read. <laughs> so I wanna tell a little story about using this tool. Uh, we had a, <laughs> this is amazing. This was amazing. We had a page at work that would um, allocate 13 million objects per request. <laughs> 13 million! <laughs> and I mean, this page, this page would return in like a second. So anytime anyone tells me Ruby is slow, I'm like, what? <laughs> We did 13 million allocations and we're able to render that page in a second. Like, this is pretty good. <laughs> anyway, I was able to get it down to about 300,000 300, objects per request uh, using, these, using these tools so we could monitor an actual request going through the application and get a real benchmark with it. And I wanna share the graph with you because it's extremely satisfying. So this is, this is the graph and you can see where, where I uh, push to production there. It's a very, very nice. So the thing that I wanna do, the thing that I wanna do with Rails 6 uh, is that I wanna make performance easy. So we make, we, Rails, we make generating applications easy, we make connecting to databases easy, we make writing routes easy, generating views, working with forms, writing tests, all of those things. But I think that now it's time for us to do the same thing with uh, application performance analysis. I think we're falling down in that particular area of uh, Rails. Yesterday, yesterday, Eileen said something that I, I really, so first off, her talk was amazing, amazing. I said to her, your slides look really, really great. And she said to me, you should go back to school. And I was like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, yes, I did drop out of college, but that, like, that hurts. <laughs> but yesterday she said she wanted to make Rails scalable by default, and I think that this is really important. This is a really important thing, but when I think about making Rails scalable by default, I don't want to make just the application itself scalable by default. I want to make your team scalable by default. I wanna make it so that not only is it easy to get started, it's easy for people who don't know, know, don't know much about uh, Rails web applications to get started. That's, that's the way it is today. We can easily start a Rails application, but I don't think that the Rails team is providing as much support as we can mid-career. So that's where I wanna start improving, is making sure that we can actually provide tools for you to move from beginner on to more advanced. So for those of you like me who cannot hire somebody to fix their performance issues, <laughs> you can just, instead of rewriting everything in Rust, you can say like, let's take about five minutes, let's just take like a couple minutes here and run this one command and see what it says our bottleneck is and maybe we can just fix that instead. So I wanna do for application generation, or I wanna do for performance what Rails has already done for application generation. And I think the, the first thing that we're going to do is start by uh, taking the tools that we use internally for doing, at GitHub for doing uh, performance improvements and pushing those into open source, pushing those upstream. So I wanna tell, uh, I have two minutes left, I wanna tell one more, one more story. I have one, one story to end with and this is not serious at all so you can sit back and relax. So I need to, for those of you that weren't here last year, I need to do a little bit of catch up. So last year, last year I gave a presentation that was uh, much more of a waste of time than this presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so last year I spoke about crap data and it, it was basically what it was, the talk where I presented this data here that I had acquired, uh, crap data. I talked about doing and analyzing this data and you know, different, different types of analysis that you could do and 40 minutes later uh, I revealed that I had uh, acquired this data by a Raspberry Pi and a motion sensor that I had put together uh, where I had mounted the motion sensor above a litter box as such and my cat would get into the litter box 
and then come out and I recorded all this data and made a log and this is, well, I guess the cat made a log. Uh, <laughs> Poop jokes, yes. <laughs> so we had about 100, 100 grams left over. <laughs> so it was lit literally crap data. But um, anyway, so the reason, the reason that I built, the actual reason that I built this thing is because uh, at, last year, around this time, we we're, we were moving, we bought a house. Like the day after I got home from RailsConf last year, we had to pack up all of our stuff and we moved. Uh, so we got a house. And my wife said to me, you have a closet full of electronics. If you do not use these electronics, we will throw them away. And I said to myself, what can I do with a, <laughs> what can I do with a scale and a Raspberry Pi and a motion sensor? <laughs> and this is what I came up with. So let's talk a little bit about home automation because this is the first thing I mean, the first thing that you do as a new homeowner, I think, well, at least this is the first thing that I do as a new homeowner, is I'm like, wow, I've got a house, I need to like automate everything. I need to automate all of the things. So we have, uh, we have a, a toilet in the house, as you do, and unfortunately we have that like blue water in it, okay? It's got like that blue cleany water in it, and the thing that's really bad about that stuff is it's basically Tide Pods for cats. They like, <laughs> Except that, unfortunately, my cat isn't as smart as a 13-year-old, and he tries to drink that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I have to. I I need a way to solve the solve this issue. The way I did it was I started. I decided to automate my house. I bought one of these. This is a this is a, uh, a door sensor. Basically, it has a it's a magnetic sensor, and on the inside it has a little reed switch. So that's our magnetic reed switch on the inside. Now, what I did is I took a tilt sensor, this is a tilt sensor, uh, I put my hand there for scale, and basically I, I uh, bypassed the, the reed switch with the tilt sensor. So we have this Z-Wave Z -wave sensor where I've mounted, imagine this is a side view, I've mounted the tilt sensor on it like that, bypassed the reed switch such that when the Z-Wave sensor tilts like this, oh, this is our, so this is our on position, so when it's like that, it's on, and then if, if you rotate it like this, it turns off. So it's as if you've, you've uh, opened the door, for example. Then, then I decided to hook it up to a siren. And I took a video to demo, uh, I think, it's, I think it's running, we'll see. So I've got, that's the, that's the siren there. There is the toilet. When I lift the lid, you can see the siren will come on. <laughs> uh, and when I close it, of course, yes. Good job editing, Aaron. Yes, it shuts off. So now I can tell when the, when the toilet is open and closed. So if nobody's in the bathroom, we know to close the toilet so that the cat does not go in there. Now aside, like one happy accident from this is that I actually have a log of all the times the toilet is open and closed. <laughs> Cambridge Analytica doesn't have enough of my information, so I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> All right, anyway, so. <laughs> I mean, I wish, I wish I had implemented this earlier so that our cat didn't drink any of that blue water and get sick, but the truth is hindsight is 2020. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope I can see you again next year.